Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. And I'm Janice. This is Quick Study Television. We are starting in the Bible in the first of the year. We've come through the Bible so far. We're in the Prophet series. This is very interesting. And one of the people that helps us put this together is Corey. Corey, what's up? Today we're going to be taking a look at some of the kings of Judah that reigned during Hosea's lifetime. Very good. Excellent. Now, you studied as well, mm -hmm. and what did you put together today? We're going to take a look at Hosea chapter 10, verse 11, that talks about Ephraim like a calf. Really? Verse 11. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that'll be interesting. Anyway, a little bit later on, I'm going to be teaching, and we're going to talk about the following. Israel's song of failure. They said that the land was helpless. How is that possible? And not that the land's helpless, but that it's in a song. And why does God put a song together? This is absolutely amazing. So get ready because we are going to do this. We're going to study. And it's time to get your Bible out and your Bible guide out. And let's do it. Let's study. First up, you and I are going to be taking a look at ancient King Ahaz. This was the second last king of Judah that reigned during the career, the lifetime of the prophet Hosea. So let's get in there and look and see what Ahaz was all about. King Ahaz of Judah was not a good king. His 16 year reign in Judah coincided with a famous king of Assyria, Tiglath-Pileser III, who brought Assyria's power to dominance in the ancient world. Second Kings, Chronicles, and Isaiah record a world trying to resist this Assyrian threat. Northern Israel allied themselves with Aram and began to fight against Judah, trying to attain more territory and wealth to hold back Assyria's armies. This is when the prophet Isaiah enters. Isaiah chapter 7 has Isaiah confronting Ahaz, promising God's rescue and telling Ahaz to test the Lord's ability to save. But Ahaz refuses. This was not piety. Kings and Chronicles have already told us of Ahaz's activities. He had been trying to accumulate spiritual power by sacrificing one of his sons to a pagan god. He had set up whole systems of pagan worship and had even secretly sent word to Assyria in hopes of positioning Judah as loyal subjects of this new empire, worthy of being trusted and left alone. The Bible tells us this plan ultimately failed. Tiglath-Pileser did save Judah from the Aram-Israel alliance, but he then turned and exacted a staggering amount of tribute. Today, we have documentation of Ahaz's reign. A seal impression from a servant of Ahaz has been found. And recently, an impression from Ahaz's own royal seal has been identified. It reads, Belonging to Ahaz, son of Jotham, king of Judah. On the back of the impression, the outline of the papyrus document it sealed, now long decayed, can be clearly seen. There is even a partial fingerprint preserved. Now, the prophet Hosea, he prophesied his career, his life, uh, went through the reigns of several kings of Judah. And he mentions this right away in the first chapter of the book of Hosea. But what is not mentioned is that his life also overlaps with the life of a few other biblical prophets. Amos, for example, received his call just a little bit before Hosea, and Isaiah received his call just a little bit after. So their lives and their careers actually overlapped. And we know this by reading the first chapter of Isaiah and the first chapter of Amos as well, because they mention uh, some of the same king names here. Now, for Hosea's life, uh, we have a bunch of kings of Judah, but we have one main king in northern Israel, Jeroboam II, who reigned for about 41 years. So he had uh, a really nice time period of, of peace and prosperity. And a lot of this was due to the fact that the Assyrian Empire was growing, but it was growing into other areas. It was expanding 
expanding into other areas. Now, a little bit later on in the lifetime of Ahaz and Hezekiah, the last two kings of Judah that overlap with Hosea's ministry, that's when the Assyrian Empire began to put uh, her focus on Israel and Judah. And we get these very interesting histories recorded, for example, in Isaiah chapter 7 and a little bit later on in Isaiah with Hezekiah. So we've got lots of overlap here, which really helps us understand this time period. God provides songs of failure for those who fall. Now the reason for these songs is so that we can learn from them. And that's what Hosea 10 was a song of, a song of failure for the nation of Israel. The biggest problem was that their leadership took the nation down to evil on a path of no return. And there was no way to get help once the king took that path. So today, we must remember where we are as people in our respective nations. We must understand that kings and leaders move in a direction that they are familiar with. For instance, this is an election time, and we elect people that we're comfortable with. Now, the idea seems, and so it seems, it's not to do the right thing, but to keep us comfortable. Now, our world is not a friendly ride, and we need leaders who are in control of the country, even if we are uncomfortable. Hosea 10, verses 1 through 9. Israel empties his vine. He brings forth fruit for himself. According to the multitude of his fruit, he has increased the altars. According to the bounty of his land, they have embellished his sacred pillars. Their heart is divided. Now they are held guilty. He will break down their altars. He will ruin their sacred pillars. For now they say, we have no king, because we did not fear the Lord. And as for a king, what would he do for us? They have spoken words, swearing falsely in making a covenant. This judgment springs up like hemlock in the furrows of the field. The inhabitants of Samaria fear because of the calf of Beth-Avon, for its people mourn for it, and its priests shriek for it, because its glory has departed from it. The idol also shall be carried to Assyria as a present for King Jerob. Ephraim shall receive shame, and Israel shall be ashamed of his own counsel. As for Samaria, her king is cut off like a twig on the water. Also the high places of Avon, the sin of Israel, shall be destroyed. The thorn and thistle shall grow on their altars. They shall say to the mountains, Cover us! and to the hills fall on us. O Israel, you have sinned from the days of Gibeah. There they stood. The battle in Gibeah against the children of iniquity did not overtake them. Hosea chapter 10, verses 1 through 9. As we continue with the book of Hosea, this is fascinating because they're writing music, they're writing songs, songs of failure. And as we look at this today, it is interesting as we look at the lyrics here and understand what God is saying, because he's explaining himself and he's telling us things about what they've done wrong. That's fascinating. Now, if you don't have the Bible guide, my question is, why not? You should write to us at the U.S. address or Canadian address. And those addresses are going to be on the screen later, so pay attention to that. And send an offering in any amount to cover the cost, and we very much appreciate uh, your offerings here. They help us. They keep the lights on and all of that stuff. 
And so you can also get this as well at the website, www.biblediscoverytv.com. That's biblediscoverytv.com. Give an offering in any amount, and it'll take you right to the PDF page. Now, as we look at this, in this particular passage, I call this, in the steps of faith, songs of failure. Because songs are very important. Remember that speaking is what we say or what we think. But the song includes the value of the soul. The song is the language of the soul. That's very important. So these are songs of failure. It's fascinating. Our read is Hosea chapter 10 to 14. We're looking at Hosea chapter 10 verses 1 to 9. And as we look at this, Janice has done a great job at reading it for you. So I want to look at this and consider it very carefully. Listen closely. Hosea chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, and here is what it says. Israel empties his vine. Israel empties his vine. He brings forth fruit for himself. According to the multitude of his fruit, he has increased the altars. According to the bounty of his land, they have embellished his sacred pillars. Their heart is divided. Now they are held guilty. He will break down their altars. He will ruin their sacred pillars. For now, they say, we have no king because we did not fear the Lord. And as for a king, what would he do for us? And they have spoken words, swearing falsely, making covenant. Thus, judgment springs up like a hemlock in the furloughs of the field. Now, this is an absolutely fascinating read. Israel's song of failure said the land was helpless, helpless. No king could lead them out because they did not fear the Lord. Beloved, it is so important that we understand that as believers in Jesus Christ, as people who have taken him as Lord. He is Lord. He has never stopped being Lord. Our technology has come and made us feel good. You know, we, we do things now that we didn't do 100 years ago. You know, we go up in a big tin can airplane and we fly it, you know, 500 miles an hour and we're all excited. But the truth is Jesus Christ is still Lord. That's nothing to him. And we need to understand that, beloved. We need to recognize that. And we need to see that a king won't help us. But we need the Lord, beloved. We need Jesus Christ in our lives. We go on to the next passage of Scripture, and it says in verse 5, the inhabitants of Samaria, that's the capital of Israel to the north, the inhabitants of Samaria fear because of the calf of Beth Avon, for its people mourn for it, and its priests shriek for it because its glory has departed from it. That's interesting. And the idol also shall be carried away to Assyria as a present for the king Jerob. Ephraim shall receive shame, and Israel shall be ashamed for his own counsel. Here we begin to see the turnaround. We begin to see it turn around. Israel's song of failure claimed they had no help because their idols failed and were taken. Their idols failed and were taken. Beloved, when we remove God, we are left empty, empty. And there is nobody who can do anything for us. And we can make all kinds of arrangements and make deals with men and governments and all that stuff and seem to get some success. But let me tell you something. Jesus Christ as Lord, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, one God in three persons, is superior to every single government of man, every single thing, every single technology. He is superior to it. We need to understand that. We need the Lord. We need God. We need somebody who goes beyond all this stuff, and that is very important. We continue on with the song, and we see in Hosea chapter 10, 7 and 9, For Samaria, her king is cut off like a twig on the water. Also, the high places of Avon, the sins of Israel shall be destroyed. The thorn and the thistle shall grow on their altars. And they shall say to the mountains, cover us. And to the hills, fall on us. O Israel, you 
have sinned from the days of Gibeah. For they, there, are, there they stood, the battle in Gibeah against the children of iniquity did not overtake them. Now this is something that's very important. Listen carefully. Israel's song of failure claimed Israel's fall began a long time ago. There is length of time between our sin and when we're judged. See, God is merciful. God is very merciful, and He puts time in there, so that gives us room to repent, room to change our ways, room to say no to the sin and say yes to God. And that room is available right now for you. And if you are someone who says, well, I need that help, I need, I need God in my life, then let me encourage you to come to Jesus Christ and to say to Jesus Christ, you are my Lord, help me, Father. Help me, Holy Spirit. Help me, Jesus, to be your person. Amen. Earlier in today's program, you and I took a look at Ahaz, king of Judah. Well, now we're going to take a look at the reaction to Ahaz. His son Hezekiah takes the throne and is a much better king. Take a look. In the world of archaeology, Hezekiah, king of Judah, is a well-documented king. The designs of his personal signet seals are known. Tourists traverse his still open water supply tunnel and with flashlights try to read the recreation of the ancient inscription at its end. Supply jar handles stamped during his reign are now used to help date ancient sites and the finds keep coming. A 5 by 4 inch white limestone fragment has been found around the Gihon Spring in Jerusalem. This is the starting place of Hezekiah's tunnel. Engraved in its surface are six ancient Hebrew letters in form very similar to the inscription found in Hezekiah's tunnel, and they are written in a monument style. Since the surviving writing is so scant, the best researchers can do is hypothesize. The inscription can be dated to Hezekiah's reign and in form linked to his tunnel. Three of the surviving letters are even in the spelling of his name. So, perhaps this is from a building that connected with the corresponding pool of the tunnel. Other intriguing finds have been seal impressions from three officials of Hezekiah, two impressions from Damla, servant of Hezekiah, another two from Tobshalom, commander of the army, and one from Amar Yahu, son of Hananyahu, servant of Hezekiah. This Amar Yahu is actually in the Bible, though you might only recognize the English version of his name, Amariah. He is named in 2 Chronicles 31, verse 15. One last intriguing possibility related to Hezekiah was unearthed at Ramat Rahel, an ancient city now within the borders of modern Jerusalem. It contains ruins of a palace dated to the time of Hezekiah, and here a clay fragment with a painted portrait was found. Could this be the profile of King Hezekiah? One of the most challenging and interesting Old Testament books is that of the prophet Daniel. Containing narrative history as well as predictive prophecy, Daniel takes us through the time of the Babylonian captivity through to the days of Cyrus, king of Persia. To help understand the book of Daniel, our on-air team have put together an hour-long presentation. In the first section, you'll hear teachings from both Rod and Corey as they investigate the history of this prophet and many of the predictive prophecies and visions he records. During the last half of the presentation, you'll join in a whole team discussion about the issues and implications unveiled in Daniel. So if you've ever wondered about the history of Daniel or about his visions and prophecies, which have been fulfilled and which are still to come, then we encourage you to contact us and get a hold of your copy of this DVD. 
For a suggested donation of $25 or more, we'd be thrilled to send you Quick Study Unplugged, Daniel. Thank you for staying with us and being a part of the program as we go through the Bible in one year. We started at the beginning of the Bible, at the beginning of the year. Now we're in the prophets. It's very exciting. <laughs> Soon we're going into the New Testament. That's that right. looks very good. looks very exciting. It's come very quickly. It has come very this quickly. This year is it passing has. very fast. We decided uh, when we put it together to go quickly in the Old Testament so we can really bear out the New Testament and listen carefully to what it's very saying. Good. So. We're very happy about that. Also, thank you for remembering us in the summer. The summer is a time when many of our partners forget about us because they're doing different things and they're busy and a lot of things are happening. And so thank you for giving. And if you didn't give this summer, uh, we sure could use your help. Uh, very much appreciated. So uh, remember us again because we need to hear from you. Anyway, uh, remember that next time on Quick Study Television, we're going to be talking about Joel. He's another prophet. Joel highlighted the plague of locusts. Now, why did he do that? Well, we'll talk about that and more next time on Quick Study Television. Corey, what's up today? Well, uh, we were going to be talking about uh, the, the offer that we created for August. So we put together another quick study unplugged. This time the topic is on Daniel. Uh, so we uh, put together two teachings, uh, one from myself about the history of Daniel, giving you the context of this exciting book and uh, hopefully help giving you uh, starting off on the right foot to understand where Daniel is coming from and what he's talking about. And then my dad, Rod, put together uh, uh, another teaching uh, about just the different prophecies that Daniel actually prophesies and the visions that he sees, because there's some that are, are, are quite interesting when you get in there and very different from other prophets. And then as a family for the second half of the special DVD program, we all came together and we tried to apply the principles that we learn in the book of Daniel to our culture today. So we just had a blast putting it together for you. So that's our offer for this month for August. It's Quick Study Unplugged Daniel, and we would love to send it to you for a suggested donation of $25 or more. Thank you very much. That We, we had a lot of fun. Corey. We did. We really did. It was really good. Well, the Bible's exciting. It, you know, it is. And when you love something, you get excited about it and want to share. So that's kind of it's what we true. did. It's true. The Bible is exciting. Yes, that's it right. Is. Very yes, good. Yes, it is. Well, you studied mm -hmm. today. Now, what did you put together? Well, in going from uh, talking about Daniel into the book of Hosea, when we get to chapter 10, the chapter is really talking about Israel's sin and captivity at that time. When we get down to verse 11, sometimes some of the things that we read are, are, are difficult for us, say, here in North America, with a different mindset and a different culture in our time now. So we get to verse 11, and it says, Ephraim is a trained heifer that loves to thresh grain. Now, I'm not a farmer, so I don't really understand what that means. And it goes on to say, but I harnessed her fair neck. I will make Ephraim pull a plow. Judah shall plow. Jacob shall break his clods. This is the Lord speaking through Hosea. Now, I did a little bit of research on that. Hef uh, Ephraim is a trained heifer that loves to thresh grain. Well, calves were sometimes allowed to walk on top of fresh grain stalks that had been laid out on the ground in order to separate the husks from the kernels. Now, lucky for the calves, little effort was involved there, and the calves could eat some of the grain while they were actually doing that. So that was a nice thing. But as we go down a little bit farther in the verse, it says, but I harnessed her fair neck. I will make Ephraim pull a plow. Judah shall plow. Jacob shall break his clods. So it changes and Israel then would cease to be like a calf and would have to plow with the yoke of discipline. So that's what that, just that one verse will, will the dimension gets a little bit deeper when we understand the context of yeah, of why and, and it's used that way. You said that you're not a farmer, and but but you did a little bit of research mm -hmm. and you figured this out. Mm -hmm. This is the point. God uses, he says this, right. and for the most of the history, man has been able to interpret it. Right. And even in the urban settings, we can understand and discover 
that, uh, you know, cows and heifers and all that mm -hmm. stuff, they're strong animals. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you drive outside the city and you see, you know, stocks of various animals and so on. And so mm -hmm. you can identify with it. That is what God is trying to do. And I want to tell you that uh, we need to hear the Lord, especially now. We need to hear the word of God. It's speaking to us. God is calling to us. He's saying, return to me. And we are in the third generation of turning away from God. And may we as believers in Jesus Christ, this is the message that I am just so involved in right now because the Lord has really just put this on my heart. We need to return back to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to say, God, forgive me of my sin. I believe that Jesus Christ came and I believe he died on the cross and rose again for my sin. Come into my life. Be my Lord. Pray today and ask Jesus Christ into your heart. There is a certain length of time between when we sin and when the Lord takes us to task for that sin. God is merciful and careful not to judge us before we have time to repent. Israel was treated the same. God chose Israel, but they soon forgot who God was and turned their hearts towards idols. Time after time, the Lord called to them. Through the prophets and others, he tried to get Israel to listen to him. They did not and God moved in with their judgment. It is amazing how God has provided for us and kept us here 26 years. You know, I think about that and that's stunning to me. God is alive and he's real. And I've served the Lord for 40 years of my life. And God wants me to tell you something. You know, Jesus Christ was his son and he came 2,000 years ago and died on the cross and rose again in the flesh so that we today could gain eternal life by praying and saying, Lord Jesus, come into my life and be my Lord.